Hey everybody, it's Susan Linder. I'm your host of the Innovation Storyteller Show. And today we are tearing it down to the beams. We are going right down to the floorboards. We are looking at an industry that we have never looked at before on this show. I am talking about renovation. And I'm gonna be asking you to renovate your own conceptions of what you think this industry is about because I am joined today by Koda Wong, who is the co-founder of Block Renovation, the platform where contractors and homeowners manage major renovation projects together. And Block enables a world where renovations are simpler, faster, and higher trust for all of its users. How many of us have had a contractor in our lives begin to work on something and walk out midway through? None of us want that experience ever again. So um, I was really intrigued by Coda's experience too prior to starting this venture. He was the chief customer officer at Red the Runway and the chief operating officer at a little known publication called the Huffington Post. So <laughs> Coda, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I, I like how you uh, snuck in a few renovation puns in there as well. <laughs> Nice yeah, well, it's a talent. It's a talent for sure. <laughs> so, you know, I'm a, often, a big fan of a good pun. <laughs> well, we often begin, you know, um, the conversations on this show talking about where we all came from. Our paths into innovation are so distinct and unique. And prior to getting started on the show, you and I were both talking about being the kids of immigrants and, you know, starting our lives off in the world of looking at our families and going, what do we do to make this worthwhile? What do we do to make our family's experience worth the while of coming to a new country, starting things off from scratch in their 30s? And we are the kids, right, who are the byproduct of that massive decision to move to the other side of the planet. So tell us a little bit about your family background and then your slow movement into the world of startups and entrepreneurship. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think being a... In, uh, Coming from an immigrant background is definitely part of, of my identity. Um, it's not something that I think about like every day, but it's probably something that's informed a lot of like the, the mindset uh, and the choices that I make in life. Um, so my family and I came over to the U.S. when I was a toddler, uh, and we first plopped ourselves in Texas, in Dallas, Texas, mm. um, and I did elementary and middle school, uh, elementary school there, and. Then from there, went to sunny California, where I did uh, middle school and high school. And one of the things that I just noticed my parents bring, uh, bring to the table every day was just like an enormous work ethic and the willingness to do whatever it takes to make it work. Because I think one of the things that a lot of immigrants experience is that there is no backup plan. Like you get there and you're, there's, there's very little uh, chance that you're gonna be going, going back to, to the country you came from. So, and you probably have very few resources, very few relationships, connections, relatives where you are going. And in our case, we were sort of the, the vanguard and we thought other family members would follow, but unfortunately they didn't and we were, not just the vanguard, we were sort of the lone wolves uh, in, in the US. And so you don't you have a sense of there's not really a backup plan. So you've got to make it work and you've got to do whatever it takes. And I think they felt it way more acutely than I did. You know, they I think they were they had a, a way more risk and I think way more fragile uh, situation in their first few years in in in, in the US. And I did, I think they were able to create for me at least a sense of security. But I still remember that period, still remember that time. And it is both a sort of driving force for me, but also it's a source of gratitude. It's like, oh, wow, I look at my life today and it's way different than, than my parents. I look at the advantages that I have and it's far greater than, than my parents. So it's like a, it's both a motivator and a sort of um, a positive reminder of positive reinforcement loop. And did you have the experience I did where you were also the official translator of 
virtually every official document that came in the house, every tax form that needed to be filled out, your financial aid form when you were applying to college, like you were the go-to translator of all that. I, I, I wouldn't stretch that much. I think uh -huh. my, my dad's English was, my dad's pretty adept at picking up languages and he, his English got um, pretty good by the time I was like a teenager and whatnot. Uh, probably maybe more so for my mom. And I think the, as a result, the default language at home was, was definitely was Chinese and Mandarin. Um, I think the translation was not just literally language, but also cultural. Mm. So I'll give you an example. I had to explain the concept of prom to my parents. And they're mm. like, what do you mean? So, so you, 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 you're a bunch of kids and you like dress up in suits one day and you go to the gym of your school where they decorate the gym and you dance and then you do it you do a dinner beforehand what what is this thing what, is, what why would you do something like this and just having to explain no oh, it's it's just this tradition that we do and this is why we you know i don't really have a why that's really it's just this is how we do this do this tradition i think that was a uh, it was more like translating some cultural concepts or i remember um you know, lear learning how to navigate the job interview process uh, and early on, and then um, coaching my 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 parents through there. It's like, oh, it's like I kind of figured out how to negotiate an offer. I figured out how to you know talk to a manager and whatnot. And like, it was not so less of a language thing, but more so a cultural translation. Like, okay, hey mom, this is how you sort of potentially push back against your manager when you do something like when there, there's a, a request that seems overwhelming or, mm -hmm. oh, hey, dad, here's how you potentially uh, negotiate your offer letter this way. Um, if you if you make this move or you say this thing and da -da -da -da, here's how you create leverage. So, so some of the translation was actually um, cultural, uh, not, not just like literally uh, the language, not the literally uh, linguistic. Hmm. Fascinating. Because um, I, I can remember some of those moments in um, in my world too. I think there were a little bit, I think the whole dating thing kind of like completely yes. threw my parents. Like that was not, that was not how things were done in the old country, needless to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was more chaste, I would imagine, back in the old country. Yeah. And throw a war in the middle of it. And suddenly yeah. dating goes completely haywire so, like very uh very low on the priority list i remember like this is just kind of a, a funny anecdote but when i was a i was a kid speaking of a cultural translation um i noticed that a lot of my friends had parents with the same last name so one of my good friends growing up his name was gerald robinson and we called his parents those parents parents were mr and mrs robinson and 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 this is interesting to me because in Chinese culture, nobody changes their last name. It's very rare to change your last name when you get married. So my dad's last name is Wong. My mom's last name is Liu. And it's like, okay, my, that's my mom, Liu, and my dad's name is Wong. Right. And so I thought in the U.S. that Americans had to find somebody with the same last name as them <laughs> when they eventually <laughs> got <awesome>. married. <laughs> and like the 20% or 30% of my friends whose parents didn't have the same last names as each other, they just lucked out, didn't luck out and they had, didn't happen to find somebody with the same last name. That is a great story. <laughs> that is fantastic. And I believed that for years. I was like, okay, I have to be on the lookout for somebody with the same, with, with also with the last name Wong, just in case like they could be my future spouse because that's the, that's the pool of qualified people for me. <laughs> Well, thank God you have a pretty big pool. I got to tell you, um, there are not a lot of Lindners out there. And sometimes when I'm really bored on a conference call, I'll just hang on on LinkedIn, hang yeah. out on LinkedIn and search for all the Lindners oh. on LinkedIn. And I'll, How many do you find? And I'll just send a message and say, hey, cuz, not sure if we're related. <laughs> or but I've never met another Lindner in my life. So I thought oh. it'd be fun to connect here. Have you done a 23andMe? Kind of thing. <laughs> you know, if I I probably am a little too data nerdy, like too data privacy nerdy that I don't feel comfortable with it yet, but yeah. just a matter of time. Just a yeah. matter of time. If if you don't do it and find them, somebody else is gonna do it and find you. Yeah, I know. Let's hope it's not the police. So <laughs> so tell us the fascinating background, Coda. So as you as you worked your way into startup world and grown-up world, um, 
what was first for you? How did you make your way into these innovation spaces? Yeah, so I actually, I spent most of my career in venture-backed companies uh, and the sort of startup land. But I actually, um, my first job out of college was at a consulting firm. Um, mm-hmm. And I wore the suit and the tie and I showed up at the client site and, you know, made decks and did Excel models and, and, and learned the basics. And I actually really appreciated that experience. Uh, you sort of- Great training. You really good training. You get a lot of experience talking to all sorts of different types of people, different types of company. You really become more attuned to your audience. You also get exposure to stuff uh, at an early age that you otherwise may not have gotten exposed to. Um, you also learn how to do a lot of grunt work. And you're like, all right, well, it's like got to do get it done. Someone's got to get it done. And so you have a high tolerance for just you know some 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 uh, uh, more boring work. You're like, all right, it's, you, you just get used to that. Um, after that, I uh, had the great opportunity to work at HuffPost. Um, I started out as chief of staff to founder and editor-in-chief Ariana Huffington. And- I've heard of her before. Yeah, she's, she <laughs> is, this year, she's turning 73 and she is just going 100 miles an hour. She has an extraordinary- Well, when she's not sleeping, because she taught all of us the value of sleep. Yes. When nobody else was talking about sleep, Ariana Huffington was telling us, okay, we understand the grind, now go to bed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think that definitely had a residual impact on me. Like I um, paid, I've over the past few years, paid a lot, much more attention to how much I sleep. Um, I have one of those sleep devices that tells me you know, the quality of my sleep and whatnot. Yep. And I think that that has lingered with me. And I think one of the the sort of cognitive shifts that I had from from working there was not seeing sleep as a trade off. It's like, oh man, instead of working, I have you know, I got to sleep because I just got to do it. It's like obligatory, but rather sleep as a performance enhancer. It's like, oh, if I sleep, I get to do better the next day. And that was a that was a definite cognitive shift. It's like, oh, it's not a cost; it's an investment. Uh, and and that was. You know, aside from all the skills and wonderful experiences, um, my relationship with sleep also shifted during during that time. But anyway, I had a great experience there. I you know, I started out as um, chief of staff and then eventually became a COO, a chief operating officer of the company, and focused a lot on the monetization uh, of 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 the content as well as global expansion. So taking HuffPost from one market to eventually. Uh, 15, 16, 17 markets uh, around the world. So it was a wonderful job to have in one's 20s. I was basically traipsing around the world and spending time in UK and Canada, France, Italy, Spain, Germany, Japan, Brazil, Korea, China. It was like incredible. And each time you just uh, parachute into one of these markets and set up a mini Huff Post there and like nurture it to life and then make it part of a broader uh, broader, broader network of, of companies. Um, after yeah, I that, had a little yeah. vision when you were talking about that, of thinking about starting a fire and like, you know, you're just there with the spark and like the twigs and grass yeah. and hoping it, it catches. Right. And then eventually you see, you know, the other beacons on the hill where the fires are already lit, but can you tell us a little bit about, you know, I love this. Um, I love talking about multicultural expansion because yeah. It's it's not just opening a McDonald's, right? It's really beginning to think about how a brand is going to have value in a new place. How is it yeah. going to be additive as opposed to we're just, you know, flying in like a seagull and then, you know, taking a dump and flying back out again, right? <laughs> so thinking about thinking about that, what can you walk us through some of the ways? I know so many of my listeners are you know, in the midst of globalization, if not veterans of it already. Can you tell us some of the ways that you sought to innovate the Huffington Post by bringing it into different markets? Yeah, yeah. So I think you have to approach it with a degree of uh, humility and curiosity. Mm. So humility that like, hey, what we figured out here in the US may or may not work in this other market. Mm-hmm. And the curiosity to be like, oh, but how could we make it work? And what can we learn to, to make it work well? So I think you go in with a point of view and say, hey, this is what the brand stands for. And this is what um, has helped us succeed so far. And remember, this is like, you know, back in back in 2012, 2013. um, And at the time, digital media was uh, was was roaring and growing and also still feeling like Wild West, still feeling quite, 
quite nascent um, and people were figuring this stuff out in, in real time. So you come in and there you come with a degree of uh, humility and curiosity and say, hey, how can what can we learn from the existing incumbents in this market? So I spent a lot of time with uh, existing publishers in these locations and figuring out what, oh, bless you, um, what worked in this market, what didn't work in this market, and how we potentially could uh, shape the, the HuffPost for that, for that particular market. You want to still have a, a sense of uh, consistency to your voice, a consistency to your values, a consistency to your brand, um, but you also want to be adaptable. And that adaptability can be in terms of content. So this certain country, you may have more entertainment content. This country, you may have more political content. This country, you may have um, more um, you know, humor or whatnot. You can also adapt it uh, from, a, from a distribution strategy perspective. So I'll give you an example. Um, when we launched in Korea, Korea's uh, at the time, this is like probably 2014, 2015, their, their mobile phone, uh, their smartphone penetration was far higher than the US. Their smartphone traffic as a percentage of all traffic was far higher than the US. So you were like, okay, how do we have a much more mobile first experience when you're consuming HuffPost, whether it's articles or video and whatnot, if you're doing HuffPost Korea, then even, the, and then even in the US. In other countries, you have to consider like, for example, India, the, the bandwidth constraints are going to be uh, more acute, right? You're not going to have the kind of, at the time it was 4G, uh, much less 5G that you have in the US or places like Korea um, or other parts of Europe. You're like, okay, most people here are operating in 3G, if not 2G. How do we make our pages really lightweight? How do you not have loading times be a deterrent to people consuming your content? So you have to think about it from a few different, few different angles. You know, I we don't necessarily think of like that tech backend kind of thing, but you know, I remember when I was still kind of like plugging in with the T1 line, you know, back in olden days, like yeah. over, um, <laughs> I would say probably 2000, 2002, yeah. and hearing about people in China who were already, you know, they had leapfrogged the entire kind of wired based internet, and we're now moving into Wi-Fi configurations that we in the United States were so tied to our legacy systems that we couldn't fathom. Yeah. Like this was actually going to happen one day. I shared a T1 connection with my colleague. And so I would plug it in. I'd write 20 emails and uh -huh. then send them all and then oh, hand the email to her. And then she would, <laughs> so I'd stack up all these emails, kind of like writing a letter. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then when I got the plug, then I got to hit send. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> and I thought, oh, wouldn't it be great if one day, Right. And this was really before even the advent of the laptop was was yeah. part of this. But at least that was an upgrade too. Um, I remember using net zero and it was like you had to compete uh, between a 28K connection, uh, uh, you know, loading one little text page at a time versus somebody wanting to use the phone. It's like, oh, OK, <laughs> right. phone, let me go on the use the internet for five more minutes and then, you know, you can use the phone or like, oh, I've got to use the phone. Can you get off the Internet? It was like a very zero sum game. Yeah. But, you know, those. um those um, cultural learnings are so important to take with us, right? There's the tech back end, certainly, but, you know, additives around humor or a seriousness, right? Or um, even what's the density on a page, like all of these things um, add up to iterative innovation inside a company, right? And then yeah. you begin to build playbooks where you can see, correct me if I'm wrong, where you can see, oh, this culture is actually quite similar to, or a similar tech infrastructure too, and therefore, we can use the Korea playbook in India, let's say, which may, was probably the worst <laughs> <laughs> parallel example, but maybe there's some crossover there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it definitely, uh, you'll, you'll, you just get a lot of exposure. You learn a lot. Um, I personally learned a lot uh, during that time. Yeah. Um, and a lot of which I carried with me to the next uh, the next chapter. So, right, Which is a natural transition from consulting to, to <laughs> having close to rent the runway, uh, uh, fashion house, and maybe you can explain exactly what the business model of rent the runway is for, um, for those of, for those of my listeners who don't, haven't rented a dress last minute before a wedding to look really sharp <laughs> at, at a last minute invitation. Yeah. So, um, the, the whole premise behind, uh, rent the runway, the sort of tagline is a closet in the cloud. So instead of owning uh, everything in your closet, 
can you also rent some proportion of it? And what proportion of it should you rent? Often there are things that you don't necessarily want to buy because the cost per wear may not make sense. And it sort of started with um, this use case of, oh, I need to go to a wedding and uh, I need to wear a dress to a wedding. I don't want to wear the same dress to every wedding because I'm in all this, uh, the photos that would show me the same dress. So the same friends um, and the same family, same friends, same family, blah, blah, blah. And the, but buying a new dress for every wedding was pretty freaking, freaking expensive. And I don't want to do that either. So what makes sense? Well, there is this sort of initial um, uh, uh, sort of idea origination was, OK, well, why don't why don't you have a company that buys buys this dress, these, this, this, this apparel um, at wholesale price? and then rent it out for a fraction of what you would have otherwise bought it for. So then it's kind of a win-win, right? The company gets to rent it out multiple times and then the user uh, gets to wear it and not have to buy the thing wholesale, but buy the thing outright. And the user can have a little bit of variety. So that was like the, that was a, the, um, the, one of the key value props is like, it, it just makes more sense economically to do it. I think what the company found over time, and I don't work there anymore, so I don't represent it, but I think what they found over time was that um, the, the use cases uh, started to evolve as well. And people started thinking about uh, uh, rental as a way to explore and experiment. And not it's not just about, um, I, I don't want to look the same at every single wedding I go to, but maybe on my date night or maybe at work, I want to try out different uh, styles, try out different flavors, and I'm willing to take more fashion risk because it's not an, um, a one-way decision where I buy it and then, you know, I have to keep it, but rather I just need to, I can just rent it and then return it and I can rent it again or not. So I think it unlocks a, a sort of different mentality towards, towards people and their, and their apparel. So I, I was, I was there for, for bid and I was uh, chief customer officer of the company. So overseeing and leading a lot of the customer facing experiences. Uh, the customer experience team, customer acquisition, customer attention, basically uh, the marketing engine of the company as well. Uh, it was um, an idiosyncratic title, but one that's really centered around the customer uh, end to end, which I really appreciated. Um, I also felt like I could come in with more of a blank slate mentality, like, hey, I am not, I'm literally not the customer. I am not a woman with a closet full of clothes uh, who has rented before. I'm not literally um, what we are targeting, but that in some ways might've helped and that I didn't just project my own preferences on our customer. I was like very curious about, oh, what, what do a bunch of women want? What do a bunch of women need? And having a more uh, empirical approach to understanding it, doing a bunch of surveys, looking at a lot of data and saying, okay, this segment of users really feels this way. This segment just behaves and feels this way. And having a little bit more of a more precision in the way we thought about our users, as opposed to just saying, hey, I feel this way. Other users must feel this way as well. You had to sort of start with the start with the, the default stance of empathy and curiosity and understanding what the users are like before making any decisions. So what do you think is the greatest takeaway as you look back on that customer facing experience? Because you First of all, you were in a unique business model, which paved the way for things like stitch fix, right? And like all these kind of um, boxed ways of procuring and curating fashion in a way that we hadn't seen before. Um, it was a whole stamp on looking at sustainability and whether or not it was a good idea to buy a dress and never wear it again and watch it go into a landfill, right? You were ushering in all these different new concepts around fashion um, and the way we wear clothing that customers were really a part of that learning and feedback to the market. Can you share with us like some of the ways that either you innovated on the marketing side or you innovated on the on the customer service and delivery side that you know you're you're quite proud of looking back on now? Yeah, yeah. And and I would I got a caveat is a lot of it was uh, me learning with the team along the way. It wasn't like, oh, I coda the coda drove all this, but it's really, hey, we're part of a team that did this. Yeah. Um, I think one of the more interesting things, though, that we learned as a team and, and we observed was how to nail an experience that was so high stakes and required so much high precision as well from a logistics and operational standpoint. Mm -hmm. So 
it's 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 a non-trivial task to have an inventory of hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, units of apparel, right? To send them out every week all over the country to get them back, then to repair, take stock, dry clean thousands and thousands of units of inventory, and then send it back out to the next user. And for that user, it needs to arrive on time in a good condition. Because okay. if it doesn't, that wedding that you're going to wear it to is not going to shift that date. Like okay. if you're one day off, that user is totally screwed, right? Or if the piece of apparel is, is torn or is damaged or burned or whatever it may be, that user can't wear it. So the stakes of these occasions are quite high. It's not like ordering you know, some toilet paper off of Amazon and the, the, the toilet paper arrives a day late, unless you're really ordering it last minute. But it's not like the toilet paper arriving a day late. You're kind of like shrug, no, no big deal. I can go downstairs and to the to the to the to the um, supermarket and get uh, another another roll. There's not really much of a backup plan for folks, especially if they're trying to coordinate outfits and whatnot. So I think a big learning was how do you nail the logistics and the operations of something that was so time sensitive and so high stakes for the user. You know, I, I correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you know, I had the good fortune of interviewing uh, the C, one of the co-founders, Jennifer Hyman. She was the CEO of Red Through One Ray on a, at an event, mm. and um, I believe that you guys had the largest dry cleaning operation in in fashion at the time because you were constantly bringing in new new. Um, dresses and outfits that needed to be cleaned. Yeah, and- I, 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 that's probably still true. Like I said, I, don't, I haven't worked in a while, but yeah. Um, yeah, at the time it was the largest dry cleaning facility in North America. It's like this pretty- is the stuff I love. You know, it's yeah. like how Amazon web services really powered the rest of Amazon while, yeah. while we were buying books. But like, there's like a whole back end to the operations that says oh, like, yeah. oh, and by the way, we built the largest dry cleaning, you know, operations, yeah, yeah, yeah. centralized dry cleaning operations. Yeah, it's very much a, by the way, kind of kind of flex. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And who would have thunk that's what you would have needed, right? When the company was founded. So yeah, impressive. So, so take us now. So you're, you're renovating now the renovation industry, right? Effectively, you are looking at it through a whole new lens. Tell us what got you to this point. What made you decide to embark on this journey? Yeah. Yeah. And fundamentally what we're doing is we're, we're helping contractors, homeowners, manage these major renovation projects better together. Mm-hmm. Um, we started this journey uh, sort of with a lot of, a lot of uh, exploration and curiosity. Uh, uh-huh. This is not an industry that I had a long and deep background in. Like these are definitely keyboard hands, not construction hands. <laughs> I haven't heard that before. These are keyboard hands. It's not like, yeah. oh, you have some soft hands. You must not do the heavy labor. Very soft hands, sitting at a desk, white collar work. Uh, fully, fully acknowledge that. Right. Um, and and so, but we came into it just understanding that a lot of folks out there had trouble doing a renovation, and trouble was almost an understatement. This is probably the one of the biggest, highest stakes, most expensive transactions that people are going to make in their lives and they're investing in their homes. And the typical person would, typical homeowner, would hire two guys in a van and just pray. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pray that they didn't have a disaster, pray that uh, they didn't have a massive cost overrun, pray that it didn't end end in catastrophe. Uh, I saw a survey a couple of years ago, uh, I think it was by House, that found that something like 12% of people got divorced in the course of doing a home renovation. Oh, yeah. There was a huge New York Times segment called the renovation divorce. And it was predicated on the idea that if you made had to make so many individualized decisions from the cabinets to the knobs, to the faucets, to the, the texture of the sink, the color right. of the walls, that that point, there were so many points of friction in the process of doing a renovation that one of you would naturally want to kill each other by the end of that renovation. (laughs) And it is, it definitely does put a lot of um, pressure 
on, on a relationship. And so that's one side of it. It's like the homeowner side is, wow, I'm about to drop so much money and I have very little idea of what I'm going to get, how long it's going to take, what it's going to look like, how much it's going to cost. Just kind of mm-hmm. rolling the dice, but it's a very expensive dice. On the contractor side, that, that shouldn't be underestimated either. It's not easy being a contractor. We, we talked to a ton of these contractors in the, in the early days. Um, and these contractors are, for the large part, good, well-meaning small business owners. And they uh, are trying to make ends meet. And they start out, maybe they were trained as a plumber or trained as a carpenter or trained as an electrician. But in being a contractor, you have to do more than the trade work itself. You've got to do your bidding and billing and payments. And you have to basically do customer support and proposals and sales and marketing, all this stuff that's not really part of your core skill set or maybe stuff you may or may not be interested in. Some may be interested, but others may not be interested in. Um, And so you're also working with a homeowner who's not very knowledgeable about construction. So you find yourself as a contractor trying to explain things over and over again to, to folks who, who like maybe are like me, who have very soft hands and just don't understand, you know, uh, 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 what, a, what a joist is, you know, when you, when you, even when you show it to them. So we said, hey, is there, is, there a, is there a better way that this can happen? Because renovations have been happening for a certain way for not just decades, but probably hundreds of years, right? It's like, oh, you hire two guys in a van or a couple of trades, trades people and, 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 and kind of go from there. Um, and, our, and our approach is to combine a few elements that really set it up for success. We want to simplify uh, the experience of doing a renovation. We do this in a few ways. We help folks get matched with a contractor. We help vet the contractor. We, we vet them um, for the quality of their work, their license and insured and uh, all these different points for, for making sure that the actual match is a, is a high quality one. Mm-hmm. We provide data for homeowners and contractors um, to be able to compare quotes, apples to apples to have, uh, we have thousands of data points of how much renovations have cost. You can kind of think about it as like a, a Zillow's est- estimate for doing a renovation, like, oh, this price is a is one that you can trust that actually will reflect the cost of the renovation. Um, or, you know, Kelly Blue Book has done this for, for car prices as well. It's like having, having a, a clear way of comparing prices. And the third thing uh, that we do is provide contractors and homeowners with tools to getting the renovation done. So these tools are digital tools like software to actually manage the renovation experience, like basically a project collaboration software. It includes payments. Uh, payments are a big point of friction for contractors and homeowners. Contractors not sure when they're going to get paid. They're going to get stiff in the last payment. Homeowners like, I have to deal with writing paper checks or envelopes of cash. We have a sort of payments platform for both parties. And we also offer uh, various additional services uh, for contractors and homeowners. They're able to um, get design services if they want. They can uh, pick between different materials packages. So imagine when you go to our site, you can see uh, different looks for bathrooms and different looks for kitchens. And you can say, hey, which look do I want? I want that one. And you can customize and configure it online. That's something that no contractor can offer a homeowner today. And we can offer for contractors and homeowners. So if you combine can these- I tell you, and- like just having yeah. that ability to limit the decision-making process or to hone in and find what you like. It took me three years to renovate my bathroom because- huh. It took me that long to pick out three tiles that I needed. Like what was the floor? What was the wall? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm indecisive when it comes to big design choices, but it was overwhelming walking into some of those stores. If someone would have guided me, totally. it would have made all the difference in the world. And I think it took it took somebody to challenge that idea that people wanted infinite choice. And I think our our position is we we think curated choice is better than infinite choice but the entire industry has operated on infinite choice for all these years. The, the default experience is let's go to a tile store and show you hundreds of tile to choose from, or go to Home Depot and show you dozens of toilets to pick from. And most people, a lot of people would be totally fine saying, hey, I like this look. Can we just make some customizations here from, and configure it for my space? And let, I'm, I'm good to go. And so we allow homeowners and contractors to do that. And we say, hey, instead of having an infinite back and forth and going to all these different stores over the weekend together, why not pick one of these preset templates to, 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 to choose from, 
make some configurations online, and then go build. And it just dramatically simplifies the experience. So you combine that with the data, with matching the contractors and homeowners together, and along with the, the software to enable the experience, you have an outcome that is simpler, more predictable, more consistent, um, and much lower risk of catastrophe than if you were just- For everyone to involved, right? Because if you're involved. using the, uh, the freakishly beautiful marble from Turkey that's only found in one quarry and you run into a supply chain issue, right? I mean, this is going to be havoc for everyone as opposed to just having some other, not Home Depot necessarily choices, but um, enough to enable you to move forward. And I just, I yeah. want to connect this back for a moment just to the customer service experience, um, you know, while you were at Rent the Runway, because I think we know this, you know, as as folks who are looking for that perfect dress or whatever it may be, um, we know that infinite choice is actually the the largest um, deterrent to making a sale, right? And so I think about how long I dragged my feet on that decision to renovate my own bathroom, but even in the pantheon of innovation choices, mm -hmm. Um, I hear it time and time again, how many innovators would love to have, you know, blue sky opportunity when yeah. it's actually the constraints around innovation that allow us to move the process forward. It's the boundaries. And I often think even of like UFC fighting, it took yeah. a really long time for UFC fighting to take off until they actually codified the rules. They codified what was okay, mm. what was not okay. And then suddenly when everyone was playing from the same rule book, suddenly you had a sport that could evolve and grow and turn into, you know, the multi-billion dollar enterprise that it is today. We actually need the constraints mm -hmm. in order to move our own innovative design even forward. Yeah, yeah. The constraints okay. definitely think about it. It, constraints can definitely breed creativity. Right? Mm -hmm. If you have no constraints, you can do anything. You're kind of like, I don't know what to do. Whereas constraints, you're like, okay, figure this thing out. It becomes a problem to solve. Right. And and, and I think when people have a problem to solve, they have certain parameters. And they have a goal like okay a solvable problem comes with parameters and a goal and they're like okay i can then i can then maneuver within this and i know what i'm what i'm what i'm aiming for so that's kind of like a, a philosophical approach we have is you know we want to shift to learn when it gets stuff out there we don't want to be too precious as a company about perfection i think we have a certain comfort with imperfection we'd rather uh put something out the door that's imperfect but improve on it over time than sit on it until it's perfect and 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 wait in for for eternity for it to for it to come out as some idealized form and even if it were to come out in some sort of idealized form even if it occurred to come out perfect it probably will be wrong you probably learn from your users and you probably get feedback so it's almost like a false sense of perfection if you're if you're holding on to it until until you feel like it's uh completely ready for for prime time so what's your vision with block renovation, Coda? Do you feel like, um, is it scaling across more and more homeowners or are you thinking about taking it in different directions? Yeah, we would love for every renovation in America to be done the block way, right? You want to do a renovation? Okay, well, you've got, uh, you're matched with a contractor and that you feel good about. You have data uh, behind how much that renovation should cost and you know with higher degree of accuracy, which you're actually going to end up spending. And you have tools to enable you to make that renovation successful. Um, we are starting with the bathroom and the kitchen. So we launched with the bathroom. Now we also have the kitchen product as well. And these are the centers of gravity for our company. Uh, eventually, we're going to move to more rooms, but we're also not going to run out of bathrooms and kitchens in America anytime soon. Uh, so we're, we're pretty focused on those two rooms at, at the moment. Um, but these are two of the most important rooms for a homeowner and right? most expensive renovation and the most expensive you look at the entire home renovation market it's around 450 500 billion dollars a year in the u.s 200 billion of that is in kitchen and bath alone 200 billion um and between the kitchen and bath it's about half and half about 100 billion each uh for for kitchen and for bath and it kind of makes sense right the the kitchen is a space where people are spending a lot of their time especially um, with COVID, people are spending less time in the office, more time at home. Um, the kitchen has become multi, multi-faceted, uh, multi-use. The bathroom is also sort of very private space. It's probably the first place you go to in the morning, and it's probably the last place you go to before you go to bed. 
Um, and it's a, it's a sort of very, yeah, it's a very private space for a lot of people. And a lot of people are looking for uh, bathrooms as a place of solace as well. So mm -hmm. people are willing to invest in these rooms. These, these rooms are also um, very uh, lopsided in terms of giving you ROI when you do a renovation. People know that when they want to resell their home someday, investing in a good kitchen and bath renovation will, will, will give good ROI for future potential buyers of their home. So for all these reasons, uh, we're, we, we see a lot of focus on, on kitchen and bath. Yeah, not to mention there are tons of systems, right? If I was looking at this from a software perspective, I think about I have electrical systems, I have plumbing systems, right? These are all the areas where, right, good design, good coding, that would go into the back end of your, of your, um, of these rooms makes all the difference in the world. And so you certainly want the most experienced people handling the back end as well as the aesthetic in the front end. Yeah, I think the the there you bring up something really interesting, which is there is a greater degree of complexity when it comes to a bathroom and a kitchen renovation. Um, there's complexity in terms of the project management. There's complexity in terms of the number of trades that are involved. There's carpentry. There's plumbing. There's electric. There's tiling. Um, and a lot of the incumbents out there are, are quite good at helping homeowners find contractors. You think about like the Angie's and the home advisors out there You say, oh yeah, I can go on there and, you know, get a lead for a contractor. If I'm a contractor, I can go on there and get a lead for a homeowner. But very often that's where folks stop. It's like, okay, I got in touch with 16 different contractors on there. I don't know what to do next. Whereas we think that you have to add a lot more value to, to the equation. And if you can add a lot more value, you can generate a lot more value for the company. You can take the entire transaction. You can make um, more margin. You can provide more assets for the homeowner and for the contractor to be successful in that, in that experience. And so that having that, like, you kind of have like the hamburger sandwich, right? You have like, <laughs> you have the data, you have the people, you have the aesthetics all rolled into one, which is like, ugh, because now I don't have to think about it. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that as the company grows, are you looking to grow as a venture-backed entity? Are you looking to grow with, in some other format? Yeah, so we uh, have been on the venture-backed um, path. So we've raised, uh, raised early on, we raised a seed round, we raised a series A, series B, series C. Um, so we've raised a little over hundred million in our, in our life. Um, we really believe that this is a company that could be generational. We, there's a massive, massive opportunity here. The status quo is uh, something that nobody's really happy about. Homeowner's not really delighted about it. Contract's not really happy about it. The market is massive. We're talking half a trillion dollars spent in home renovation. So this is a company with massive, massive potential. On top of that, there's real money to be made here, right? This is not one of those things where, hey, we'll build something like a cool app and let's see if we can make money from this advertising on this app someday. This is a business in which people are spending lots of real money on their homes today. And if you can capture a slice of that, you have a really good path to building a really sustainable business. So having good financials, having good unit economics, um, being really disciplined about finances and being good stewards of capital is something that's very important for us. Um, and so as we're on this venture-backed path, we also want to be super disciplined about how we think about financials, how we think about economics, how we think about sustainability of the business as well. Yeah. And are you, um, are you thinking about um, growing internationally as well? Uh, currently, no. Uh, I think part of any venture is uh, the, the willingness to say no to certain things so you can focus on what's most important. Now, that isn't to say that there aren't contractors and homeowners in other countries that struggle with the same problem. As a matter of fact, there are many, and we've definitely got um, uh, inbound interest from many countries saying, hey, we need block in this country. Hey, can you bring block to this country? Uh, it's very flattering, but also at the same time, I think we have to be very centered and say, hey, there's plenty of contractors, plenty of homeowners, plenty of bathrooms, plenty of kitchens in the US alone. And if we even get 
a tiny fraction of market share in the US, this would be a multi-billion dollar company. So that I think would be a, it would be a champagne problem one day to run out of uh, bathrooms and kitchens in America and have to go overseas. I think for the purposes of focus um, and for having a quality product and a quality user experience, it's better for us to, uh, to, to have our sights on, on the US for now. Well, I mean, and let's be realistic, right? 10 years from now, the first customers you've had that have engaged with Block, um, they're going to be ready for a renovation anyway. So you'll just go around again. <laughs> yes, yes. I, we actually find even less time than that. Some people, some homeowners who are, uh, you know, hey, I did my first bathroom with Block. I want to do it again. Now that I know, you know, what it's like to work uh, with Block, I'd rather do my kitchen with Block as well. So we're, we're already starting to see it. And the interesting thing, exactly. Susan, is that one of the interesting things is that we do a lot of studies on customer satisfaction. We do a lot of studies on contractor satisfaction, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's interesting to see that our, our homeowner satisfaction, our customer satisfaction on that front, um, and their conversion rates on the sales side are higher for people who have done a renovation before versus people who have never done a renovation before. It's like, kind of, why is that? You know, And, and one of our, our, our hypotheses is that people who have done a renovation before they sort of know what the other side looks like. They have felt the pain. They, they know how, how much their blood pressure has gone up and how many years of their life they have lost by trying to do it all the, the old school way. And so they're more likely to jump to a better solution when one comes along the way. And when they actually experience that uh, alternative way of doing things, it's like, oh, wow, I'm never going to go back. So it's really interesting to see like our, as, as, uh, we gain more momentum, we get more scale, and more people are educated. A lot of it's education because you know, a lot of people are not doing renovations all the time. Um, you start seeing more and more momentum for, oh, why would you do it the, the traditional way if this alternative superior way exists? Right, for sure. It's just about changing our mindset as customers, right? Yeah. Um, Koda, this has just been such a fascinating conversation. Where can people get in touch with you? Uh, well, we are on... Uh, our website is uh, www.blockrenovation.com or block B-L-O-C-K, renovation.com. Uh, and if you want to contact us, it's just hello, hello uh, at blockrenovation.com. Hello, not two hellos. Hello at blockrenovation.com. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me on the Innovation Storyteller Show today. Thank you so much. Thank, take care. You too.